Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com or in the iTunes podcast library. I also have with me Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems, also very famous for the Open MPI library. Uh, Jeff, thanks again for helping me out. Hey, Brock. How's it going? All right. Good. Uh, so this afternoon, we've got one uh, a project uh, that I've heard about for a long, long time, but I actually don't know too many details about it. So I'm kind of interested to talk to our guests and find out what's what. Yeah, at Michigan, we've toyed with the idea of using XCAT. We were a big uh, uh, customer of one of XCAT's big supporters for a while. And uh, we're still using our old system. We're still kind of in the market for something like this. So um, our guests today are Valard Benicoso and Egan Ford, who are here representing the Extreme Cluster Administration Toolkit, also known as XCAT. So, Egan, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, Thanks, this is Egan. Um, I right now work at IBM. I lead one of our uh, uh, team of uh, HPC and cluster architects. Uh, I'm also the uh, leader of the uh, XCAT open source project and and its uh, creator. Val? I work for a startup company called Sumavi. I, previous to that, I was at IBM working on Egan's team. As one of the lead developers at Sumavi, I still contribute to the XCAT project and have a lot of fun with it still. And Valard was on both of my teams. He was both a, uh, a Linux cluster architect as well as one of the uh, core XCAT developers. So why don't you give us the 10,000 foot view of exactly what XCAT aims to accomplish. XCAT is primarily a uh, provisioning system. Uh, The goal from the beginning was to get an operating system on as many boxes as quickly as possible. Uh, It's still one of its uh, primary goals. Uh, Originally it was not for HPC, it was uh, development started in 1999 for web 1.0, and there was this uh, uh, explosion of people that needed to uh, provision uh, Linux at scale, and that kind of uh, fueled the uh, the ideas and the development and the design uh, of XCAT, because at the time we we couldn't find uh, at scale uh, provisioning uh, solutions. And so the, the big picture is, you know, get the OSs on the box, because once you have the OS on the box and you have SSH, well, then there's there's a lot of different tools out there that you can use to manage your environment. Um, however, as XCAT development uh, evolved over time, more and more uh, features were added so that they could use XCAT as more of a uh, cluster management and do more than just put OSs on the box. But but of the things that XCAT does, you know, hardware control and, and console management and, and discovery and, and, and boot target control uh, and OS provisioning, they're they're all kind of in the uh, the provisioning family. Let's let's get OSs on, on the machines at scale as, as quickly as possible. So what exactly is IBM's relationship with XCAT? Was this something that started off inside IBM? Because if I remember right, IBM had another tool that kind of did what XCAT did for its power series. Yeah, that's actually what I, Valard, was um, when I first joined IBM. I was tasked with the job of working with that group. It was a tool called CSM. And XCAT had already been created, but it was just used by the field technical People, it wasn't used by the developers, and it wasn't really sanctioned. And has IBM's official way to go, and so you know, Egan and his team kept plugging along and, and adding all these great features. And the one that was used for Power, which was called CSM, actually just went end of life about two years ago. So, and IBM's strategy has been that now XCAT will be its uh, HPC deployment tool going forward, and CSM is end of life. And, and just to add to that, uh, for CSM, there was PSSP, and I, I think that may have been what you remember that predates both uh, XCAT and uh, CSM. Uh, un- unfortunately, PSSP wasn't, uh, wasn't available uh, for non-power platforms and uh, doesn't, doesn't support uh, Linux and, and uh, 
you know, some of the things that were taking place as we were doing XCAP for Web 1.0 and then later uh, HPC. So uh, something new had to be uh, created, and and uh, that's how XCAP got started. And then uh, IBM, as they started looking towards the uh, uh, future on, on a way to take the best ideas of um, – of PSSP and, and and the best ideas of, of XCAT and then they and then they created CSM, uh, but but there was a, an, enough penetration uh, with XCAT and XCAT was doing uh, some other things and supporting uh, other OSs like Windows and so on that that kind of fell outside of uh, uh, CSM. Um, but we, we kind of came back together again in 2007 and said, let's just take the best ideas of XCAT again and take the best ideas of CSM and we we started together on on XCAT two. And it's a new development, new team, new architecture, uh, you know, new code, and uh, but but you know, ten or fifteen years of of ideas uh, rolled up into that. So, how did the decision come about uh, to open source XCAT versus keeping it proprietary? What was the thought process that led to that? Well, well, yeah. my thought process personally was that. I, I I liked open source, um, but uh, and and XCAT one wasn't open source. It, it came with source code, but that's not the same as open source. You 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 couldn't modify it and redistribute it like uh, traditional open source licenses. Um, it, it came with source code to offer a certain amount of flexibility, but but XCAT two uh, the there was a, a decision by all of us, and we agreed that. Uh, it should be open source. Uh, some of the interest in doing that for IBM was that we could develop cluster management with a smaller investment on IBM side because we would have the open source community to help with the uh, uh, development and, and, and the evolution of uh, cluster management. Uh, the HPC space moves very quickly, and so an open source development model and that type of collaboration with, with customers and users uh, uh, can help speed that along. And uh, we asked our customers, and uh, they, they came back and said, yes, uh, we, we would like something that's open source and something that we can contribute to and collaborate with, like a lot of other things in the uh, Linux HPC space. Um, but we would also like support. And so we focused on creating something that was open source and, and met our customer needs and our IBM needs. But, uh, uh, but we were also able to come up with some way to provide, uh, you know, support contracts and so on for those that, uh, for those higher maintenance customers. Gotcha. So then I'm kind of assuming that XCAT supports, a variety of different hardware and, and software platforms. What's, what's kind of the gambit of what you support? Uh, right um, now, as far as – I'll take this one. For, for hardware right now, we're, we support a lot of – of course, all the IBM Intel machines, and then there's also the IBM P-series and the Z-series. Those, those things are in there. But pretty much since we have this IPMI support in there, most of the white boxes will work with uh, you know, doing remote power. And you know, let's face it, a lot of them are all just the same pixie boot you know, get up and going type uh, environments. But um, in addition to that, some of the guys from uh, HP actually wrote an HP plugin so that we have control over the blade their their blade chassis. So we're able to do all those neat commands that we could do with, um, well, some of them that we could do with the IBM blade chassis. We can do those with the HP blade chassis as well. I'll just add to that that um, uh Support means different things to different people. And so what hardware XCAT works with uh, is, is one thing, and, and what the community supports uh, is, is one thing, and, and then what vendors support uh, via support contracts and things like that uh, uh, is another. And so, um, so, so when, you, are you, when you say support, I'm assuming that uh, the, the XCAT code, what, what – platforms can it can it automate or or function with and uh, you know, Val Valor uh, pretty much stated that but if you're asking well 
if I want to buy XCAT support from IBM, what, what do they support? Uh, we're, we're limited to support the environments that we can uh, test, document, and, and develop on. And so it's not going to be ex as, as expansive as what XCAT uh, might work with. Yeah, I actually I, – I meant what Valard uh, uh, answered, but your, your clarification was a much better phrasing of my question. And so both answers are appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> So I've got a question. So host side for managing a host, the bare minimum to make things work is you just require IPMI, you said. Is there any host side software that needs to be installed to kind of have continuous management of a host past it being installed, or does your OS load not really need to be modified to work with XCAT? Well, that was one of the design things we learned very early on from customers is that they didn't want any clients on there. And if they did, then it was something that they would already have had in their environment. Like some people really like Gangria, some people like Nagios. And so from NextCat's perspective, we just install the machine. Once it's installed, it signals back to the management server saying, hey, I'm installed. And he flips the Pixie boot or whatever boot mechanism you use so that it will boot from hard drive or whatever it may be from the next time in the case of Stateful, and it will just boot back up. And if you didn't put any agents on it, there won't be any agents on it. So XCAT doesn't require them anymore. It, so, it doesn't require them, but it, it, it doesn't even have any. We don't have any code to install on, on the machines. I wanted to backtrack to your previous questions. We didn't we didn't completely answer it. You asked about uh, what uh, software or OS is XCAT supported, um, AIX Linux and Windows. Really, you guys support Windows? XCAT server does it run on Windows, or can you actually like load Windows boxes from Linux using XCAT? The the the, the latter. XCAT's a provisioning system that requires uh, Red Hat. SUSE Red Hat like or AIX as the OS for the management node and the management infrastructure if, if you have uh, uh, multiple nodes to, to assist XCAT. Um, but uh, for the target, target machines, it can be uh, Windows, uh, Linux, AIX, uh, I guess I, I, ESX, we support ESXi, uh, VMwares, and, um, and that's it. Those, those are the target OSs that we can provision. So yeah, you guys the, don't. Go ahead. Sorry, was, oh yeah, I was going to say that there's also the ways that we install the machines. So uh, the Windows, you have several options. You can install it via ImageX using Microsoft's native tools, or you can use the standard image image not ImageX, but using the unattend file that we use that Microsoft uses. And you can do iSCSI, you can do right onto the disk. So, and then with Linux, you have the stateful options. You can do it stateless, meaning that the operating system it runs in memory. And the other option is you can run what we call state light, which is where some of it's NFS root, some of it could be in memory, some of it could be on some other hardware, hard, hard drive partition somewhere else. So it's, yeah. it's quite flexible. And for ESXi, we do that stateless as well. I, I think we're the only... I'm fairly certain we're the only open source solution that can actually take VMware ESX and then just download it directly into memory and, and uh, execute it. Uh, we do that with all the hypervisors that we support. Uh, with Zen and KVM, it's fairly easy. Since we have uh, stateless, diskless Linux today, we can do that with those hypervisors as well. Yeah, I was, I was just working today. I was, or actually last week, I was trying to get that new ASXi stuff has... Uh, actually has a kickstart file on ESXi 4.1, which is pretty different from what VMware has done before. And so we're able to kickstart those just like the normal ones and you know install it if needed or stateless or stateful. Your choice. So is this the limiting factor then, these, these different bootstrapping mechanisms um, for what operating systems you support? Because you said before there is no client-side software, so assumedly... Uh, any limitations must come in how you bootstrap the operating system. Is that is that a correct statement? Um, I think so. I mean, there's there's all diff these different ways, right? So there's also part image support, and so people will take you know images using part image, and then we'll just take that image, and then we can blast it out the same way. And um, but I I think generally, and then there's also this concept of boot target. So if you already have your 
thing set up and you know exactly how you want it to be, then, you know, you just tell us what you want your pixie file to look like and we'll just make it in there and then everybody can boot off how you want. Is that sufficiently vague or enough detail for you? That is absolutely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the boot target support's actually quite nice. We have a number of, of IBM customers using XCAT that have developed their own provisioning methods or have, uh, you know, some other external system or open source or otherwise, and they just need, uh, as part of uh, cluster and cloud management, they need something that can build the uh, TFTP uh, structure, update DHCP, uh, create the uh, uh, Pixie or uh, GPixie files and, and the, uh, uh, you know, the definition so it knows how to boot and, and, uh, and so on. So uh, we'll, yeah. we'll conti- yeah, continue to have that for those people that want to want to roll their own uh, provisioning systems. Yeah, they may just want XCAT just so that they can power the machines off and on in a, in a cool way. And so some people I know just use XCAT for doing the remote power control and the remote console control, and they do their own way of provisioning the system. So it's quite flexible in what it can be used for. So I want to clarify something. The uh, XCAT, since this has nothing client-side, if you want to use XCAT for pushing out updates and stuff, it doesn't really do that out of the box. You need another tool to do that. XCAT just kind of gets your boxes up. So the short answer would be, would be yes. The, the primary purpose is to get the box up. Uh, we, we do have tools um, for after-the-fact administration, things like parallel shells and parallel copy and, and uh, uh, ways to push out uh, updates and, and files and, and things like that. So we, we do have some code that does that, but that piggybacks on top of SSH or, or RSH. And so that's, that's the daemon that we're using on the machine to perform uh, those types of functions. We don't have a, a dedicated uh, service that sits on the machine and, and waits for XCAT to uh, tell it to uh, do something. Um, now, there's some philosophical differences. Uh, we've been advocating the use of stateless since 2005, and we've had it in XCAT since 2005. And, and uh, uh, early on, we, we used Werewolf, and then later on, we, we transitioned to, to writing our own because it became very important to us and very important to our customers, and it's even stated in their RFPs and so on. And uh, that's, a, that's a different way of doing things. You, you, you move away from this concept of I've, I've got a thousand machines and I have to go out there and touch them and manage them to managing centralized uh, core images that you just push out. And if you need to make a change, you make it someplace central and then you, you reboot or reprovision the machine. And uh, in, the, in the last five years, the vast majority of the customers I've worked with, that we, we've stuck with this model. And so we haven't really developed you know, really nice, easy, you know, life cycle management tools, you know, things that can hold your hand and put out a new kernel on your machines for you and, and stuff like that. You're, we have some tools that will help you do that at scale in a, in a, in a distributed fashion, uh, but you're going to have to kind of know what you're doing uh, in, in those types of environments. So uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm still a strong advocate of the stateless and kind of want to uh, stay down that path because it just makes administration so much easier. So you mentioned something about turning machines on and off. I want to hear more about this. What does SCAT have to do with um, controlling the machine's power state? Uh, we, we wrote our own uh, IPMI library um, that would just go out and, you know, we tested it at scale and it just fits within the same infrastructure that XCAT has where you have a list of node or a node range that you could use and it will just go out and you can turn them off or on. Um, you can also do it with different machines like uh, Blades. You know, you talk to their management interface, and th- which they may not be going over IPMI. The other thing you have with, with that is you're able to do remote console, which just gets the serial console. And the other, some vendors offer uh, a remote video support, so you can just see that. So instead of having to open their web interface and get to it, you just run a command like R- wvid, and it'll just pop open the, uh, the interface to see it. So this power controls is integrated with any resource managers or other allocation managers or data center management to kind of like power off less critical machines on certain states? Um, so, yes, but it's not 
it's not XCAT making those decisions. Um, XCAT's um, the senses and, 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 and the muscle, but it, it doesn't have a brain. It's not a, uh, uh, you know, an adaptive management uh, type, of, type of solution. So in environments like that, we, we, we partner uh, with uh, Adaptive Computing's MOAB. Uh, uh, MOAB understands how to um, talk to XCAT via its uh, uh, client-server XML uh, protocol, and so it treats XCAT as one of additional resource managers that you might have in the area. And then if uh, there's no uh, workload uh, destined for those machines, then Moab instructs XCAT to power off those machines. And we, we have these environments in production at, at a couple of universities and, and the Department of Energy and uh, one bank on Wall Street right now, and it's kind of one of the paths that we're taking with XCAT is to have it be this uh, platform for HPC Cloud and to provide not only powering machines on and off, but we do support power capping and, and IBM hardware, and we have interfaces for that, and, 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 and making decisions on other metrics that can be collected is, is the machine healthy? Maybe I shouldn't put workloads on there if it's destined to fail because it's had too many ECC errors or so on, and uh, maybe I want to do thermal balancing or, or find uh, other metrics that I want to use for, for making decisions as to which machines to turn on and, and uh uh, what workloads to uh, place on them. So, so yes, it can participate in that because it does have that ability to remotely control power and read other hardware, hardware metrics uh, in the data center, but XCAT by itself can't, can't make those decisions. Some, something else needs to make those decisions. We're just so it'd be more accurate. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'll just say we're just, we're just a, like a, you know, when you have those cartoons and they have the evil – guy who does all the thinking and then he's got like some big guy that does all the work or something that's that's kind of how you would view xcat is the big guy who does all the work and then there's some smart like pinky in the brain or something i don't know so it'd be more accurate to say that xcat is integrated in with moab than uh to say that moab is integrated in with with xcat right ah uh... I don't know. Is that a, is that I mean, a poorly phrased question? Uh, what I, was yeah, going I, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> it's yeah, okay. uh, e each is a standalone product that can stand alone on its own. Um, uh, Moab needs resource managers, whether it be Torque for launching jobs, which we'll call an application manager, or XCAT to install OSs, which is a provisioning manager. Uh, you, it needs resource managers, and it supports a whole bunch of different ones. XCAT just happens to be uh, uh, one of them, but Moab doesn't need XCAT to power things off. I, they, you know, they, they, I'm sure there's a resource manager that it works with today that does IPMI natively, for example, and if that's all you had in your environment, uh, uh, you wouldn't need uh, uh, XCAT. Uh, and then maybe they could do something else for provisioning. Who knows? At least with XCAT, you kind of get it all there at once. And, and again, XCAT doesn't need Moab to operate. You can hire administrators that are intelligent. They, they do exist, and, and, and you can ask them to turn machines off for you. <laughs> Let me follow that up with another question. And so uh, you guys have done some partnering with Moab. Have you done partnering with uh, other resource controlling or resource manager uh, types of application suites? Um, others are interested. Um, one I can speak of would be Virtual Computing Lab out of NC State. Uh, they've, they've been automating XCAP for about uh, five years now, and they use XCAP for both bare metal as well as uh, virtual machines. Uh, it's a uh, application or a desktop on demand type of environment, but they also do HPC jobs as well. Uh, but if you're a student at NC State and you need Mathematica, you go to this portal and you say, I need Mathematica on Windows. And uh, you know, 30 seconds later, it's got it provisioned and ready for you and gives you instructions through a web client or RDP or whatever uh, to get access to that uh, application. And so VCL would be the workload manager and the portal that provides both the job queuing and, and requests as well as the uh, scheduling. And then that controls XCAT on the back end. Uh, VCL is open source as part of the Apache project. And... Uh, currently supports uh, both XCAT 1 and XCAT 2. Cool. Yeah, we at, we at Sumavi are also talking to a, a number of other uh, people in this space as well. So it's been really interesting. But, uh, you know, part, partnering with Moab was, was easy. Uh, we've had a 10-year relationship with them. Uh, most of the largest exotic data centers uh, use uh, Moab. 
And it's going to be those same data centers that are going to start looking at um, building larger systems and, and uh, uh, consolidating various different OS personalities and want to provision them on demand. They're the same ones that have the challenge with consuming megawatts of power and they want to be able to uh, save energy and so on, and the same ones that uh, aren't very tolerant to job failure. And when you have lots and lots of machines, when you have 30, 60, 90,000 memory DIMMs, you can have daily failures. And if the machine is sick, you want to know it and then avoid it. And so uh, uh, partnering with Moab made uh, uh, made perfect sense. And so we started this collaboration in 2005, and, and uh, around by 2008, we had, we had DemoWare, and, and we've been rolling it out since early 2009. So XCAT doesn't actually, like, the OS that is tied to a physical box or a given VM is not, XCAT doesn't really care, like, it's fluid, I can say this host is now Windows 2003, and three hours later, now it's Red Hat 5.4, and two hours later, it's Red Hat 4, based on customer demands, like, it's that flexible, that simple, as long as XCAT has the images, it can load it? Yep, yes. Okay, I got to get me some of that. <laughs> That'd be ridiculously <laughs> handy. Yeah, it's it's been quite nice. And then you know, all you do is just run your one command, you know, set boot and then or net boot or whatever it is, and then it'll just reboot it, and it's just great. Okay, so then XCAT, like I would have to actually ask XCAT, like kind of what the state of all my nodes are at a given point in a data center. What what? You said it also collects other information. What's the most common metrics I can kind of get from XCAT? What what power does XCAT give me to look at quickly uh, the state of my data center? We give you temperatures. If your IPMI supports it, you can get the power usage that you're using. You get if a machine is on or off. You can get the serial number, which is quite handy when opening uh, support tickets uh, against hardware that's failed. Um, you can get uh, fan speeds, and you can get um, some some cases. You can get the BIOS uh, versions on there. A lot of it is just dependent on upon what the hardware vendor supports. But there's quite a bit. I mean, you're just querying either the the service processor, or you're you're querying the node via SSH. You can get whatever you want. So a, a common one that we would use, you know, let's make sure all our clocks are in sync, and then you just run your P shell command and just see if all the clocks are there. It's kind of, it's very similar to what, um, I know a lot of you guys might use PD shell. So it, it, this one just comes natively with XCAT. It's one that we had from the beginning. There's additional information you can get. And, and as we start moving more towards HPC cloud, we're learning that we have to deliver a lot of other information about the state of the machine. And, and sometimes you, you don't get all the information from one source. An XCAT would be one source. So, so Valor just described all the hardware information that we can gather, and that's that's pretty agnostic and OS independent. Uh, we we do collect some OS information. Uh, we do have a node stack command that that Moab leverages to understand more about the state of the machine. Is it pingable? What services are up? And and things like that. And, and we use that by automating Nmap to fingerprint the machines uh, to hand that information back to uh, uh, Moab through our our XML. Um, that, that helps Moab understand that, well, I, I, I told the machine to provision. I, I gave it 10 minutes, and I know it's on, and I know it's pingable, but for some reason, Torque hasn't checked in yet, or uh, they have their own resource manager for Windows. That hasn't checked in yet, so I'm not entirely sure what the state of the machine is. Uh, in a situation like that, they, they usually rely on uh, Torque or, or uh, some other uh, uh, resource manager to provide some information as the state of the machine. Uh, that said, XCAT does have a monitoring infrastructure. We don't supply monitors. Uh, you, you have monitors plug into the infrastructure, and, and right now we support Ganglia and PCP and, and uh, IBM's RMC are, are different monitors that you can have out there. And then as they collect certain bits of information, they get injected into the uh, XCAT database. And so you can, when you query the database, you can collect other information. And so as we move forward, you're going to start seeing that not only are we collecting uh, machine or OS status, but we're also going to start collecting application status, and the state of that information is going to be uh, stored in the database so that you can make queries uh, very easily and make decisions very easily instead of asking XCAT to go out and get the information for you. Uh, the data uh, uh, is and, and will be timestamped so that you can make 
your workload manager can make decisions whether that information uh, is, is new enough or falls outside of policy and you have to ask XCAT to manually uh, go and refresh it. So, so we've got a lot of that in there now and, and moving forward, uh, we'll be getting more and more, but we have to start doing uh, application and, and more OS monitoring. And it's really going to rely on existing monitoring solutions because we don't like to reinvent the wheel. Uh, unless absolutely necessary or if it's a lot of fun. But for the most part, we, we want to use established things like Ganglia and, and RMC and PCP and, and collect that information and, and uh, get it in there. So for actually loading new equipment, clusters are getting bigger and bigger. And uh, probably the simplest system I've seen so far is rocks. You run insert ethers, you turn on a host, and when it sees it, you turn on the next one. Uh, how difficult is it to add systems to XCAT, especially if I'm ordering a thousand nodes or one of these full shipping containers from IBM filled full of machines? Um, that's so. I think that's one area where XCAT really differentiates itself. Um, XCAT was written by myself and and Valard and and and, and people even lazier than us. Um, we don't like the concept of powering machines on one at a time. It's too error prone, uh, can't be automated. Uh, so since 2002, we've been collecting MAC addresses in a deterministic fashion by mapping the MACs to some physical known quantity. Um, in, in, in the XCAT1, we used terminal servers. Uh, terminal servers were very common. Uh, there wasn't serial over LAN or, or any type of uh, um, uh, console over Ethernet. And so you had terminal servers. And uh, so when we built a new system, the one known quantity that we could rely on was that this node was plugged into uh, this terminal server in this particular port. And then uh, when you turn machines on, we, we have a dis uh, if, if the MAC address is not known, it gets a dynamic address and downloads uh, a small version of Linux into memory, collects information on the machine, and then uh, uh, XCAT then starts um, querying those terminal servers and finding uh, MAC addresses. And when it sees a MAC on a certain port, it knows exactly which machine that is and then can update uh, the appropriate uh, appropriate tables. Um, with XCAT2, we've moved towards doing that with Ethernet switches instead because we don't have uh, terminal servers just are, I don't think I've seen one in the last couple of years. It's it's all uh, serial over LAN now. Uh, so the, the one known quantity for us is the Ethernet switches, and we query them via SNMP v3. It's, it's all encrypted and secure. Uh, we, we've been told as part of XCAT2 requirements, we can't have any plain text on the wire. And uh, we we query the switches, and it's it's it doesn't matter what the vendor is; they're all pretty uh, consistent, and it's it's not too difficult to uh, uh, collect the MAC addresses out of the machine. And and uh, so that kernel image boots up; it keeps pinging to keep its MAC address alive in the switch, and we know exactly how everything's wired, and and uh, that's stored in the database, and you can store it via regular expression, so you can be even lazier uh, when defining your system as long as whoever cables it does it in an orderly fashion. And uh, we will collect the MAC addresses, um, MAC addresses that way. And, and then for things like blade systems where you have absolute addressing, you, you, blades are in certain slots, and you can query that from the blade chassis manager. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's always been very simple. You don't really have to do anything but just uh, query the blade, uh, uh, like the blade centers of the advanced management module, just query it and say, give me all the MAC addresses for the blades. And I've stored in my database which nodes are in which slots and which chassis. And so, therefore, I know uh, what the MAC addresses are. So, so MAC address collection's always been automated for nearly eight years now. Uh, we call it automagic uh, discovery. And if a node fails and you've got your someone calls IBM, they can come out, replace the node, walk away, and it'll, it'll self-discover. If it gets a new MAC address, it'll say the system board got replaced, the MAC address is new, and the discovery process is fully automated. It just boots up, downloads that Linux, notifies XCAT, goes and gets the MAC address, looks at the, uh, the chain of events table and says, oh, well, after I clicked your MAC address, you're supposed to flash your firmware, and then I need to put this OS on you. And it's, it's fully automated so that even a manager can do it. So as long as people cable it up correctly, I'm going to have to talk to some people I know about that.
<laughs> well, well, that's good for you though, because you want you want you want to have a good record of where your machines are connected to your switch for you know just if you have to analyze network traffic or any other types of events that can come up. And so instead of having just this Excel spreadsheet where you're keeping all the the data, you have an active database that is updated, and you can get reports from Mexcat as to where everything's connected at. It's pretty quite handy. So that sounds like you guys. You put 10,000 nodes and it'll figure out where 10,000 of them are and load them up right away. Exactly what kind of, I kept hearing you guys say scale, scale, scale. Just what kind of scale does XCAT actually work at? Like how long does it take to boot a 10,000 node stateless cluster using something like XCAT? Um, so that that's one of those uh, it depends answers. Um, you, you have to design your systems for scale. Uh, XCAT can't give you more bandwidth or, um, you know, fix the way your environment was cabled or, or the poor decisions that were made in, in the network topology. Uh, so you, you have to exercise a lot of common sense and uh, make sure that you've designed the system to be uh, managed at scale. Um, that said, uh, we, we did do some benchmarks on uh, a couple uh, – one. 10,000 node system and, and a 4,000 node system and uh, we could provision both of them in, in under 10 minutes that if XCAT was up and if XCAT's infrastructure nodes were up that's part of the secrets to its scale is, is having more than one thing out there to provide the necessary bandwidth and throughput so if the infrastructure's all up which can take you know, once the XCAT management node is actually installed and configured and set up uh, which is the, the hardest part that can take days um, but uh um, the, the infrastructure nodes take about 10 minutes to um, boot up. They're stateless as well. They have a special image on there and a special uh, configured version of XCAT. And uh, they, they, you, you don't work with them. They actually, XCAT kind of forms a cloud with its infrastructure nodes, and it's just kind of one thing. And uh, But as long as all that stuff is up, uh, you should be able to, and, and you provide enough bandwidth. We, we understand what the network bandwidth ratios are, and uh, we use those when we design these systems. But as long as all of that's in check, uh, you should be able to provision any size system uh, uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, our, our design point for XCAT 2 is 100,000 nodes is, is uh, our design point. Which has become quite handy, especially as, as we've been doing more and more virtual machines, then the scale is... Um, becoming something that, you know, if you didn't think about it before when you were designing your systems management systems, then it's really going to hit you right now as you start dealing with more and more VMs. So uh, through the course of the conversation here, you, you've mentioned a, a couple of differences between XCAT 1 and XCAT 2, but you said in uh, 2007 you kind of re-architected and, and took the best ideas and started from scratch. What are some of the user noticeable differences between XCAT 1 and 2? Um... Real database would be one. Yeah, it'd be easier to tell you how they're similar. Um, they got the same name. <laughs> well, that's that's okay, that's good. not true because we started calling it extreme extreme cloud. Yeah, uh, yeah. Jump, jump on the bandwagon there. Um, the command structure, like the command line, uh, the commands and the and the command line arguments uh, remained the same um, but everything else is different um, xcat one was written for one customer and then we just kept evolving it and it was written mostly in corn shell and uh it, it and although our largest customer had thirty thousand machines being managed with it uh it uh, and we had the concept of service nodes and stateless and, and all these things that we learned from, from 1999 to 2005 uh, are, are important things that should be in XCAT. It was getting uh, uh, more and more difficult. And, and we did have three layers of abstraction to kind of help make things a little bit uh, easier, but uh, it wasn't designed to, to scale with developers. And so 99% of the work was done by myself. And... Um, and, and where we learned the most was in 2005 when, when uh, uh, Dave Jackson and I got together and said, let's, let's try to solve one of the problems that customers have, and that's silos of, of compute resources. Let's find, find a way to combine it all and then provision on demand. That, that was just, you know, we, we had an on-demand center, and then there was uh, a lot of talk about utility computing and, and so on in, in 2005. And um, so we, we, we 
started doing that, and we, we really discovered that that XCAT one was was not it wasn't written to be automated. It, it didn't do a good job of handing back information, and uh, especially if, if you ask a hundred machines to turn on, you, you can't get an exit code of zero or one. If, if a subset of the machines failed, you need to be specific about which ones failed so that a decision could be made. You don't want to constantly query uh, the uh, information uh, to, to do corrective actions and, and things like that. You want to know exactly what failed and then perform the corrective actions on, on those ones. And so, uh, so and, and we, we found that, that even these large environments, uh, updating the DHCP environment for 30,000 machines could, could take hours and because uh, uh, it was all written in in script and it wasn't very efficient and and so uh, some of the, the the big items would be client server um uh you know all communications encrypted uh database uh we still are maintaining uh, uh, uh multiple abstraction levels so that you know when you plug in a new power method uh, you can write a Perl plugin you put it in our plugins directory and xcat can start using it you don't have to rewrite a bunch of the front uh front end uh so that that remained um, XCAT 2 has documentation. That's a huge change. Uh, and man pages. Uh, even man pages for the database structure. Um, Eclipse public license. That's a major change. But uh, it's not, it's only XCAT name. And we kept that name because XCAT had uh, good brand recognition uh, in the US and, 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 uh, and, and Asia and, and some parts of Europe. And, uh, but the architecture it's 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 from the ground up it's completely different it was done by a team of people not not by any one individual and uh um so that's you know it's just, the, the whole development process is significantly different as well so th- th- there's really nothing similar between xcat 1 and xcat 2 except for except for the name and uh so, so some of the commands so that as someone went from xcat 1 to xcat 2 it wouldn't seem completely foreign but that's about it so what's the largest public uh, managed machine uh, managed by XCAT? Um, the, the largest one that I, I know of would be the uh, Lanel Roadrunner. Uh, it was number one on the top 500 list for about 18 months. Uh, I think it's number three now. Uh, it's got roughly 10,000 elements. It's, uh, it's a hybrid cluster of cell blades and, and Opteron blades, uh, all stateless. Um, second largest I can think of would be Cynet. It's uh, 4,000 nodes, HPC Cloud. It uh, was number 16 when we benchmarked it last year. Uh, I th- I'm sure it's in the top 30 still. Um, roughly 4,000 machines, again, all stateless. Um, this is one of the cleanest data centers in the world as well. We power the machines off when they're not in use. We avoid sick machines. Uh, users can provision whatever OS they want uh, on demand, so it's kind of a true... Uh, HPC uh, cloud environment, but uh, uh, very uh, green as well. And and its Linpack result was done over gigabit Ethernet, uh, not not over InfiniBand. Um, the, the 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 cluster is a hybrid of of various technologies, and InfiniBand is only on about uh, one fourth or one fifth of the uh, systems. And so Moab has to make sure it puts the right workload on the right networks. And and there's also a uh, uh, Power Six uh, cluster as part of as part of that system as well. Are those the two systems you mentioned earlier that only takes you ten minutes to provision those things once XCAT's running? Yeah. So on on the Roadrunner system, uh, and we tested this in manufacturing, not not at the customer. So it's, it's easy to test these things before you put the customer's configurations in there. Uh, but each connected unit has its own broadcast domain, and each one of those by themselves uh, we could boot up in about ten minutes once the uh, infrastructure was up and running. Um, so it, in, in theory, since each of those things are uh, standalone uh, uh, systems from a, from a uh, networking and, and broadcast domain point of view, each one of them should boot up in 10 minutes in parallel. Uh, Cyanet is uh, really a, a 4,000 nodes on a single broadcast domain where we have 12 service nodes that kind of operate in a, uh, um, HA uh, and, and load balancing uh, fashion. And that one, we, we timed repeatedly at, at booting that up with a stateless version of Linux in about eight minutes. So let me take a different tact here. Who else is involved in the XCAT community? So you mentioned uh, at various points teams and multiple people, and you guys obviously represent two different organizations. Who else is involved? Who are the contributors, core contributors, users, things like that? How do you guys function as a community? 
Um, um, I know I'm, I'm outside of IBM, so I basically communicate through the mailing list. So there's me. I know that Adaptive Computing has has added some uh, features to XCAT. And um, I think there's a couple other people on the mailing list that will just say, you know, I found this feature to be useful, and then they'll want to contribute it. So we'll just give them a spin, write access, and then we'll just write add their code up in there after it's reviewed by Egan and Jared and stuff. So yeah, I'd, I'd say that the the vast majority of, of developers with uh, SVN commit access is uh, are from IBM uh, and they're spread uh, across, you know, China and, and Poughkeepsie and, and, and Raleigh is where the, the concentration of, of those developers are. And they're representing uh, um, some of the different hardware platforms that uh, we, we have to support. But, you know, Sumavi and Adaptive have SVN commit access. Uh, uh, LANL has SVN commit access. I'm actually going through our SourceForge page right now. <laughs> and uh, um, and, and, and some individual users. And, and it, it works the same as any other open source project. You uh, submit uh, some patches for review, and uh, we review them. And uh, after time, we you, we you gain some trust or... We get tired of looking at your patches, and we, we give you SVN commit access. Uh, all communications done through uh, either private email or uh, through the mailing list. Um, but Valard has been a guest speaker on our weekly XCAT architecture calls. Uh, we have uh, two-hour calls every Thursday to discuss uh, XCAT roadmap and, and and IBM's objectives and customer requirements and so on. So we we you know the XCAT's roadmap is uh, aggressively steered towards uh, the uh, input that we collect. Uh, adaptive computing has participated on some of those calls when it's like, you know, what, what do we have to do better and, and uh, in, in terms of uh, XCAT for cloud and, and things like that. So, uh, so sometimes there is that face-to-face -face or uh, uh, conference calls where we, we get together and discuss these things. So one question I like to ask a lot of other open source projects is, uh, you know, what version control do you use and why? And I heard you say subversion. So do you have any particular reason for using subversion? SourceForge. Fair it's just, enough. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's just, you know, I set up the SourceForge project. Uh, uh, one of our senior developers, Jared, uh, checked in the code, and we've we've used uh, SVN uh, ever since. I don't think there was a, a religious debate or a strong preference um, by many. Uh, SVN seems to be a fairly uh, common standard. Yeah, I know that Sumavi in our in our private code will use GitHub. Um, I just don't think we even considered GitHub back then. I don't even know that we knew much about it. I, I don't think I don't think it was considered either. I, I, we just used SVN. It wasn't even really thought about. Yeah. So, uh, what's coming for the future for XCAT? We got a lot of cool stuff coming up. I mean, there's going to be more. Uh, I, from our perspective, we want to add more hardware support for different vendors. Uh, I'd like to see. Uh, I'd like I'd like to do more partnerships with people from from different companies and software companies to do more integ integration. Um, specifically, there's been a lot of, that we've been doing around VMware right now. Um, you know, we just added the the ESXi 4.1 Kickstart support, which is pretty cool, and. Um, I think uh, I'd like to do a little bit more with Windows um, just because I, I've, I've had quite a few customers asking me for that. Um, it'd be nice to have some more. One of the things that we recently added was an image export ability so that people could share images and that we could you know, not have a store but just have a repository that more people could just grab standard vanilla images on download them and even make XCAT that much easier to use. So um, those are some of mine. I don't, I don't know. You can, maybe you have some that you could add or you maybe you're looking at the wish list. Uh, the, 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 image, the image capability that, that Valard's working on is, is um, very nice and I think very critical for the future. And, and, and to be clear, it's not an image per, as much as, as it's a complete definition uh, because it could be stateless or stateful or, or uh, various different provisioning methods. And so it doesn't have to be a pre-installed. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's it not could a pre-installed image. 
it, it could just be a kickstart file with a couple of post install scripts that are in a tarball that you you know you export and then you could import it in somewhere else yeah so that's that's a very nice uh, a very nice feature um, xcat has several roadmaps uh, a, a an obvious roadmap would be you know support the latest from an IBM perspective, support the latest IBM hardware as it comes out. Um, support the latest OS updates as they become available. And so that's that's always on our internal roadmap is uh, we know when we're going to come out with new product and we, and we know when OSs are going to release from vendors and we need to make sure that we have that support in place uh, at the time of release or, or yeah, very we already close have, to it. We already have Red Hat 6 support in there, which is nice. Yeah, so so that's that's a given. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of requests for cloud-like solutions and, and automating XCAT, and uh, we are learning a tremendous amount about the type of work that we have to do, uh, error reporting and robustness and scale that is necessary to work in these cloud environments, and that's that's constantly uh, evolving uh, uh, XCAT. Uh, you know, and, and and we're learning that not everybody who tries to control XCAT does it in a sane fashion. Um, it's it's better to make single large requests to XCAT and let it figure out how to do the scalability than send in lots of individual ones. And and, and XCAT's not unique in that fashion uh, of uh, you know databases and other uh, uh, services out there. You make a lot of little requests. It's a lot more difficult than than fewer large ones. And so we're working on. Uh, our own queuing system and a way to aggregate uh, similar things to, to make XCAT more efficient and to, to alleviate the pressure that can sometimes be put on XCAT um, in, a, in, a, in an automated environment. These automated environments, it's like having a thousand administrators constantly doing things. And, and, and 99% of it's just querying of information. And uh, so we, you know, we're working towards uh, making that uh, a little bit more robust. But if you really want to know what's in XCAT's future, if you want to know what the most exciting thing is, a- ask yourselves or go out and start asking people. Uh, we, we are driven by uh, requests, uh, specifically you know, the, the, the customers that we work with. Uh, they define our roadmap uh, uh, more than any other. And uh, things that we had never planned on putting in XCAT uh, we're there, and just in the last year, ESXi support and this new state-like provisioning system that Valor created uh, were two huge efforts to uh, get into XCAT that were driven strictly by uh, customer request and and customer demand. And so, I, I can I can see about six months into the future because I know what I'm working on, but I can't tell you what's going to be in XCAT next year because I need people like yourselves to tell me what you want in XCAT, and and that's what we're going to use for our direction. So Val, what was the idea that required you to start up Sumavi, and why what you're doing there is different than what IBM was doing with XCAT? Well, I, I was actually very happy at IBM. I I had a great time there. I you know I learned a lot and stuff, but I just wanted to do more with XCAT than I could do there at uh, IBM. I, I wanted to be able to enhance the code and I, I wasn't being funded to work on the code and I wanted to do uh, get a team of people that could be more focused on the requirements that I was seeing and so uh, we started Sumavi with the intention of you know let's let's enhance Xcat let's let's make a commercial version of it because there was a lot of user unfriendliness to it um, you know, once somebody understood it, then it was very easy. But we wanted to go after more, you know, enterprise and and uh, people that might have been more on the Windows side, where they they weren't so used to the heavy command line use. So with Sumavi with XCAT, we've we've really focused on developing a very easy to use web interface, and we've enhanced um, some of the plugins, make it so that they're a little bit more. Uh, reliable on some of the data that we're getting back. So we actually um, didn't. We, we've contributed back to the Xcode Cat source as a as part of that because some of the things were like well, we don't want this to fork from Xcat. So it's been a very uh, very good experience, and I I think it's been uh, helpful to um, you know people who aren't so good with Linux and and just want to know how to just want to get their system running. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, both Egan and Val, and this show will be up soon. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot for having us. No problem. Thanks.